And firstly, um, good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for tuning in at uh, um, such an early time. Um, and um, again, I'd like to introduce our speaker, Dr. Akshay Rajangam. Um, so AFP in Leicester. Um, and um, on screen, here's a list of um, well, um, everything our speaker's achieved. So um, she's, as, as I mentioned, AFP Dr. Leicester in medical education. She's also a former president of KCL Surgical Society. She um, integrated in anatomy and she's had multiple pr publications, particularly in urology and in ENT as well. So I think um, we're actually quite honored to have um, a fairly well, fairly well-rounded and also um, a very knowledgeable speaker. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to hand it to her um, to start the session. Brilliant. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mahersh, and uh, a very good morning to all of you. Um, it is quite incredible to see what close to seven, seven more than 70 um, young people tuned in on a Saturday morning. So I guess I hope I can do you justice over the next couple of hours with this topic. So the topic that uh, I've chosen to take you guys through today is renal. Now, renal is something that pretty much people hate or people love. And it's one of those misunderstood, uh, poorly taught uh, specialties, I guess I could say quite generally in medical school. And you get to grasp it when you actually see it in practice. And once you dissect through the different types uh, of renal pathologies, you actually get an appreciation of how much it relates back to its physiology and how simple it is because the management, regardless of pathology, is pretty straightforward uh, for renal. So hopefully in the next couple of hours, uh, we can journey through some of the common things uh, and even uncommon things that we'll be able to see in renal and uh, urology. Something that I hope that will help us with our clinical practice uh, when we become doctors. So there's a whole multitude of things with renal, but I guess we'll start with um, a little bit about renal physiology, um, because once we can grasp the physiology, even at a basic level, we can apply it to any form of uh, pathology or clinical picture that we see uh, come to our doors, whether it's in the hospital or in the GP setting. We'll then dive through some of the common things that I have uh, mentioned uh, in the list. And whilst there is no formal kind of SBAs throughout the session, there will be plenty of questions that I'll be asking in each turn. So please use the chat to answer them. They are open-ended, so you can very much exercise your clinical judgment or very much uh, use the chat to ask any questions that you may as well. We'll also have a short break in the middle because uh, this is a very heavy series of topics. So I'll try and make it as uh, palatable as possible. If there are any questions, please shoot them on the chat and we will take them in turn at the end of each topic so we can address all those questions together in a clump. Brilliant. And if you guys can't hear me at any point, please do give me a shout or drop it in the chat as well. So first question for you guys, the kidney 101. So can you follow the flow? So without me demonstrating any picture or any kind of hints, in the chat, are you able to drop starting from, let's say, um, the abdominal aorta? What is the broad renal tract in order? So for example, if we were to place in a jigsaw, the bladder, the urethra, the ureter, the kidneys, in what order do they come through? Okay, we've got one person who's responded and I hope the others are following suit as well. And very good. And it's pretty basic, right? But it's important for us to get an appreciation uh, and commit this to uh, memory because what we start with the abdominal aorta and we branch off into the renal arteries and that's what supplies the kidneys. We have the adrenals sitting on top, superior to the kidneys. Um, one is more crescent shaped and one is triangular. So the right is triangular and the left is more crescenteric. Then we have the kidneys descending to form the ureters which then enter into the bladder at the superior lateral aspects. And then at the inferior aspect of the bladder, we then go into the urethra that then um, 
exits uh, through uh, each of our genitalia. Now, any pathology concerning the renal and urology can happen in any of these parts. It can start right at the aorta and end right at the external urethral meatus, which is that opening at the end. So all of this concerns kidney and uro um, renal and urology medicine. So here's the next question. If we zoom in to a nephron, which is that, I guess, foundation uh, particle that you may call it, or the tissue that, that does all of this hard work, what is the order if we start, if I just say we're going to start with the glomerulus and end with the collecting duct, what is the order of this nephron? So very good. So we have the glomerulus followed, um, which feeds into the Bowman's capsule, which then goes into the proximal collected conv convoluted tubule. And that's at the part of the cortex. And as it descends down into the medulla of the kidney, you have this lovely loop of Henle. You just you then go up into the distal convoluted tubule and come right down to the collecting duct or the collecting tubule before you enter the ureter. Again, all of the fun and exciting stuff uh, in renal physiology takes place in this one small particle, the nephron. I was meant to animate this, but I guess it didn't work. So very broadly, the functions of the kidneys can be broken down into the simple acronym, a wet bed. So kidneys are responsible for a multitude of things. Acid-base balance, water balance, ensuring that uh, we have enough water or fluid in our system, electrolyte balance, uh, removal of toxins, controlling our blood pressure, forming erythropoietin, which very much plays an integral role in our red blood cell formation, and vitamin D metabolism, so that vitamin D can then be used um, in various parts of our body. So everything that then goes wrong with a kidney, uh, or if the kidney messes up, all of these things start to mess up. And you can ask Akshaya, why are you going into such detail with these basic things? Because these are some of the things that patients will present with, and patients don't come and say, I have a renal pathology. They come in with a whole host of symptoms. So for us to be able to piece the, uh, piece the puzzle together, it's important for us to appreciate the functions of the kidney. So what exactly is this filtration pipe that we looked at? So we have this nephron and we go through the different uh, you know, journey that starts in the glomerulus and ends off in the collecting duct. So I thought, let me just take a, quiz, um, a quick whistle stop tour through this journey, because probably most of us would have studied it in first and second year. And from this poll, I can, think, I can see most of us are actually clinical medicine. So this is something we put at the back of our you know, brain to collect dust as we focus on clinical medicine. But actually, uh, this becomes important uh, when we again look at blood, blood, blood results or we look at patients presenting symptomatically. So very quickly, in this graphic, it's highlighted quite well, and I can't take credit for this uh, picture. But if we run through it very, very quickly, I'm going to see if I can. You guys should all be able to see my mouse as well. So if we start at the glomerulus, this is that highly high pressure filtration system that happens as it pushes against the Bowman's capsule. And you have the afferent and efferent arterioles, which are running through, and almost the blood is just getting circulated in high pressure. And ideally, nothing that is large protein or red blood cells ought to come in uh, through this Bowman's capsule. You only get a little bit of glucose and amino acids, predominantly water, sodium, potassium, and bicarbonate, creatinine, and urea. And as we journey through that proximal convoluted tubule, that first stage, more than 65% uh, gets absorbed, uh, reabsorbed. So all of our glucose and amino acids will get reabsorbed. So we shouldn't see anything in our urine. 65% um, of our so NACL and water, along with potassium, will also get reabsorbed. And I think if we go back to our physiology, we can you know, remember all the different pumps and uh, channels through which this takes place, which I'll not go through today. We then go down through this loop of uh, Henley, the descending and the ascending loop. Now, this is where, again, we reabsorb more of the sodium chloride and water. And this is where we really are able to concentrate the first step of urine. 
And then we go to the distal convoluted duct. And this is where aldosterone uh, produced in the adrenal cortex is able to, um, to come and reabsorb some of the water. So we're continuing to concentrate our urine. We then travel down the collecting duct where we have uh, antidiuretic hormone, ADH, uh, stimulated or secreted from the posterior pituitary gland. And that goes down the collecting duct, again, reabsorbing once more the NACL and water and excreting a little bit out. So at the end of it, we should only have the ideal urine, which is urea, creatinine, a little bit of sodium chloride with potassium and bicarbonate in tiny trace amounts and water. The ideal urine has a pH of about 4.5 to 8, and that's the normal range. And urine in an ideal world should not have any glucose, any protein, any nitrites, any ketones, or any blood. So this is a whistle-stop tour through, through renal physiology. And if we can understand kind of the basics of what actually goes on in the kidneys and how all of this happens, we can easily navigate through um, pathology or clinical uh, symptoms that come through our doors. I'm just going to take a quick pause there and see if there's any questions coming through. Okay. Um, For sorry, I think there's one question up ahead. It was just saying, um, what level does the renal arteries come off the abdominal aorta? That's a very good question. If I am not mistaken, uh, do not quote me on this, um, but I believe it is either um, the L1 or L, no, it's much higher. It's T12 L1, T12 L1. Um, and I think that's where the renal artery comes out. And the venous system is uh, also different on the left and the right hand side, where um, in the left side, it's uh, again, one to look up because I have forgotten um, those basics of anatomy, but it's at the level of T12 and N1 because the kidneys sit anatomically quite high up actually, um, sit at the level of T10 uh, to T12, um, one higher than the other. On the, on the right side, you have the liver. So you have to accommodate, um, sorry, on the left side, you have the liver and on the right side, you have the um, stomach. So you have to accommodate for the, level so um i believe one kidney sits above the other and this is uh me going back to first year anatomy but i believe it's t12 l1 but do don't quote me on this and if someone finds the answer do put it in the chat as well so, i find that actually a lot of people get confused with electrolyte quality. and this is something that uh you know very much comes through the pictures uh, comes through the doors quite a bit so I thought, let me start off by focusing on one particular electrolyte imbalance, hyponatremia, and see if we can navigate through that. Does anyone know what hyponatremia means? Feel free to drop in the chat. So hyponatremia is low sodium in the blood, and you can look at it into three categories. The first one is hypovolemic hyponatremia. So this is where we are losing volume, complete volume through our body, and we end up with low sodium. And this can happen uh, because of di commonly because of diarrhea and vomiting, when we sweat a lot, um, certain endocrine disorders, and certain medications, uh, such as diuretics, etc. Then we have the second part, which is euvolemic hyponatremia. This is where our, our body volume is preserved, but we are actually only losing sodium. So our entire water levels are still the same, but we're just losing sodium. Typically, when we have symptom uh, syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone production, uh, when we are absorbing too much water, we are diluting the sodium. Uh, so that's when we tend to have euvolemic hyponatremia. And then we can have hypervolemic hyponatremia. Now, this happens in three types of diseases or failures, heart failure, kidney disease or kidney failure, and liver disease, where we are, you know, just absolutely taking in all the volume and it all goes into third space. So it's not, not actually in our vessels, but just starts leaking into our third space. So you'll see really puffy, swollen patients and they have low serum sodium because they're just so full of um, volume uh, in the entire body. 
And then you have pseudo hyponatremia, where you look at the blood levels and you go, hang on a second, sodium is less than 135, but it actually is not less than 135. It's because they have so much protein and so much uh, triglycerides in their blood level that it automatically um, reduces the concentration of sodium. Sodium is measured in millimoles per liter. So it is measured in concentration levels, not in absolute levels. So you can have pseudo hyponatremia. So when a patient comes through uh, walking with low sodium in the blood, the first question to ask is, is it mild? Is it moderate or is it severe? You then ask, is it acute or is it chronic? Anything that is endocrine, anything that is of a, um, you know, anything that is messed up because of the endocrine system generally takes time. So it's unlikely to be acute if it's of an endocrine pathology. Now, with something like hyponatremia, most patients will actually be fine and it'll be the GP who picks up and goes, hang on a second, their sodium doesn't seem quite right and send them to the, through to the hospital. If it's severe, if it's you know moderate to severe, that's when they start to present with symptoms like vomiting, dizziness and confusion. So how do you investigate this, right? You first start off by asking, what is their volume status? Because you want to be able to find out the cause of why do they have low sodium in their blood? So for you to be able to categorize, is it hypovolemic, euvolemic or hypervolemic? You gotta ask, what is their volume status? And a simple blood pressure will point towards that. You also do a urine and serum osmolality. And I'm gonna be honest with you guys, this confused the heck out of me back in medical school. So we are going to run through what a urine and serum osmolality is as well. And then you ask yourself, okay, are they on any medications? Can you guys think of any medications, you know, common medications that will typically uh, result in low sodium in the blood? Well done. Uh, we have some smart cookies here. Um, diuretics, absolutely. That's the first thing to think of. And you know what? In, in, in real life clinical practice, so many of us forget to check the drug chart and we start treating patients uh, with hyponatremia. But then it's important to take a step back and go, actually, what is causing this? And as something as simple as crossing off a drug in a drug chart can really help their symptoms. And then you ask yourself, what are the other symptoms? Generally, it's some, something like an endocrine uh, pathology. You will have a whole host of other symptoms that contribute uh, to this picture and you'll be able to delineate and work accordingly. Okay, so what is serum and urine osmolality? Osmolality typically looks at how, how, many, how much stuff is there in your serum or your urine. The more stuff you have, the higher the osmolality. And it actually measures quite um, a few things, a few parameters. And you can see in this equation very quickly, osmolality looks at sodium, glucose, and urea. And you can calculate this. We will never calculate this in clinical practice, but it's good to be aware of what goes into this calculation. Because when, some, when a patient presents with normal osmolality, but low sodium, that is, if they have normal amount of stuff, but they have low sodium, that means typically the, the low sodium is a result of the high proteins and the high lipids that's being in their bloodstream. So it's more likely to point towards a pseudo hyponatremia that we looked at earlier. If they have a high osmolality with low sodium, always, always think about diabetes because they have a, seem to have a high level of glucose that's masking all the sodium and their overall osmolality is seeming to go up. So you think of diabetes at first instance. So that is the serum osmolality. You can do the same with urine osmolality. When there is low osmolality in the urine, that is if your urine has very little stuff in it. And we looked at what typically constitutes an ideal urine, right? If your urine typically has very little stuff, it means that your ADH is not working. You're just spewing out all the water because your antidiuretic hormone is not able to concentrate at the last stage in your nephron, in the collecting duct. So then you start thinking, okay, does this patient have some form of, you know, um, diabetes insipidus 
or you know something that is uh, quite not right with their antidiuretic hormone. And as we looked at earlier, the ADH is produced in the posterior pituitary. So then you'd start to investigate the pituitary gland uh, and you would start to do all your uh, CT heads, MRI heads to uh, work through those. If they have a high osmolality, that means that their ADH is working. It's not trouble with concentrating their urine. It just means that they're excreting a lot of sodium. So then you think about, okay, if my osmolality is high, why do I have a high osmolality? Is it because of my sodium? Is it because of my glucose? Or is it because of my urea? If your sodium is still less than 30, it means that actually the kidneys are fine. Then the kidneys are actually working fine, but I'm still suspecting something somewhere. So this is where you start to look at systemic causes, i.e., do they have any underlying heart conditions? Do they have any underlying liver conditions? Why is it? Uh, why is their osmolality so high? If their urine sodium is really high, it's more than 30, that means there's something intrinsically within that nephron mechanism that's not quite right. You then start to think about, okay, um, are they on diuretics because they're excreting all their sodium with their water? Or do they have kidney disease? Um, generally, when the kid, when, with intrinsic kidney pathologies, your entire mechanism to reabsorb um, sodium, reabsorb potassium, they all get messed up in the nephron. So then you start to think, do they have kidney disease? Now, this is a very quick um, whistle stop through urine and so serum osmolality. And it's still quite a lot to wrap around. But just think of it as stuff, osmolality stuff. High osmolality, lots of stuff. Why is that? Low osmolality, not much stuff. So is it because they have too much water or is it something else? Now we can look at, okay, we have someone walking through the doors with low sodium in the blood. We have worked through all of our different kind of uh, categories. We've thought about, okay, is it because of their volume status? Is it something that's come on suddenly or is it something that's uh, taken a bit of time to come on? And how clinically unwell are they? And why is it that they're having low sodium in the blood? So we have done all those different investigations. And renal medicine is pretty simple, right? Once you find the cause, you treat the cause. So if you can't find the cause, you still manage them conservatively till you find the cause. That's as simple as renal medicine. So in this case, if they have low sodium, slow serum sodium, without any volume loss or volume gain. That means that their volume levels are fine. They're just lacking serum sodium. So you give them a high concentration of hypertonic saline. So this is fluids with a very high concentration of hypertonic saline. If they're hypervolemic, i.e. they have way too much volume in their body, and that's why they have hyponatremia, you start to fluid restrict. So in a clinical practice, you'll start to see uh, doctors saying, put them on a fluid balance chart and you really monitor how much they're taking in, how much they're taking out and keeping it very strict. Typically, it's at a 1.5 liter restriction parameter. If they're hypovolemic, so they don't have enough sodium in the blood because they don't have enough water in their blood, then you pump them with 0.9% no more saline. If they have symptom, a syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone, you give them a vasopressor. So you can tell actually it's their ADH that's not quite working. That's why they're losing all their sodium with the water. So I'm going to correct that instead. So it's pretty straightforward in terms of managing hyponatremia in a clinical setting. Now that's the first topic done. Does anyone have any, does anyone have any questions? I'll pause for 30 seconds there um, so that we can have any questions. Okay, I've had a couple of questions so far. So the first question is, um, which hypertonic saline do you use? Now, typically you can go for like 1.25% um, NACL, but that will also depend on the trust guidelines. So generally with fluids, um, each trust will adopt its own policy, but it's anything beyond 0.9% saline because 0.9% is normal saline. So you'll go for a 1.25% or higher, depending on your trust guideline. 
Now, how would you know ADH is a problem? Would you have to do a water deprivation test? Absolutely. So if you find that actually, um, so uh, a simple measure of urine, uh, urine sodium, like we looked at earlier, can point to whether we have uh, the issue with the ADH or not. So that will give you your first clue. And then you can confirm your diagnosis with something like a water deprivation test, or you can start to treat clinically. Often what they can also do is you can give a trial. So you can give a trial of a, a single dose of a vasopressor um, and see how they react to it. If you find that actually that is uh, adjusting their urine sodium levels and their general osmolality levels, then you know that automatically ADH seems to be the problem here. So you can either go down the investigation route or more than often not, clinically, you can actually trial a dose and see how they react to it. Okay, now don't fret too much if you didn't understand uh, hyponatremia, because again, um, it's something that you gain more with practice. But now we're going to go to something that is a little bit more common and something that will haunt us in our finals and our past papers as well. Hematuria. So when I say hematuria, what do I mean? Blood in the urine. Very good. Now, does anyone know how we can classify broadly hematuria? Very good, very good. Uh, you guys honestly you don't need to be here, you know, you guys seem to know all of these things. So you can classify hematoria into visible or non-visible. And I have this thing called the mixed bag where it kind of doesn't really fit in anywhere. Um, and that's nephritic syndrome. But typically you can classify hematoria blood in the urine into two broad patterns, broad visible, or you can call this as gross or frank in other terms, or non-visible, that which is microscopic. Common causes of visible hematoria are things like benign prostatic hyperplasia, urinary tract infection, uh, which can be in the lower urinary tract or the upper um, urinary tract, which is manifested as acute pyelonephritis, or um, slightly less common, so bladder cancer. The uncommon ones are typically trauma or if they are presenting as anemia. You'd rarely see anemic patients presenting with hematoria. Uh, it's usually anemia secondary to hematoria rather than uh, anemia causing hematoria. Then you have non-visible hematoria. So this is where you have to pick it up in the dipstick. Uh, it's not as visible or as frank. And typically some, some types of uh, UTIs, menstruation, stones can present as non-visible hematoria. And uncommon, again, you have renal cysts or some form of cancers, which, which can present as microscopic hematoria. Common things are common, and the way we go about hematorias are pretty similar, even though there are different classifications here. So let's work through a few cases together. Case one, put all of your doctor hats on. You have a 40-year-old 40 40 year female who's going, I'm feeling a burning sensation every time I use the toilet. Uh, I feel like I need to keep rushing, and I'm going a lot more frequently. And it's also quite itchy down there, and I think, I think I also spotted some blood once. What do we think is happening? Okay, we seem to be getting some consensus for UTI. Okay, someone said STI, um, fair point, fair point. So typically, um, females are actually quite prone to getting, um, you can have urinary tract uh, infection quite commonly actually uh, as a female in your 40s. Um, or even younger. Young females are quite prone for UTIs, and I've seen a fair few cases already. And so the first step for any kind of hematoria uh, that comes through the door to a urine dip. But if they are above 65, if they have a catheter, or if you know that they have a predisposed urinary condition, you do not do a urine dip. Do we know why? Very good. Your chances are you'll get a high result of false positive or you will pick up something in the urine dip anyway, which isn't going to give you much. So only if they are less than 65 without a catheter or is uncomplicated, do you do a urine dip. And I'm sure in our first and second year OSCEs, we would have, been, we would have done plenty of urine dips. So I'm not going to go through a urine dip. Now, second, if, they, if you can't do a urine dip, uh, or even typically sometimes you do a urine dip, you'll also send it for my microscopic culture and sensitivity. So you ask them to pee in a pot, a midstream urine, 
sample and you send it to the labs. But for a lower UTI in this case, an uncomplicated lower UTI, you don't wait for the results to come back before you start management. And does anyone know what is the management for an uncomplicated UTI? Okay, very good. Try a combination of trimethoprim or nitrofurantoin. Now, don't ask me which one over which. That, again, depends on each of our trust guidelines. In our trust, in Northampton General, we opt for nitrofurantoin more than trimeth, actually. And it's a three-day uh, cause of antibiotics that we give. And if that, if that fails, then we swap for the other. And then if that fails, then there's a third-line antibiotic that you can opt for, something that's a little bit more broad. So uncomplicated UTIs are fairly simple. You can get a burning sensation, so dysuria. You get increased frequency polyuria, uh, they can feel quite um, itchy down there and maybe some blood. So don't be alarmed by the blood, just do a urine dip. And if you find that it's positive for nitrites, which is uh, bacterial presentation, then you treat them as UTI. Now let's go with a little bit of a twist in that same case. This patient who's 40, again, presents with all of the previous things, but now presents with fever, nausea, vomiting, and pain. What are you thinking? Okay, pyelonephritis. Actually, someone pointed that it should be longer for women. It again depends on the trust guidelines, Nikesh, because in our trust, again, we only treat UTI for women, even for women for three days only. So it very much depends on our trust guidelines. Um, some will go for three days, some will go for five days, and some will go for seven days. So I wouldn't hold very strongly uh, to the date or, or the frequency, um, the duration as such. So yes, this patient presents with pyelonephritis. But again, the first step is to again take a microscopic culture and sensitivity and send it off to the lab. Now, you typically diagnose pyelonephritis with the MCNS results, and this can take up to 48 hours. You start them on antibiotics, but once it comes back with the sensitivity, then you tweak and, one, and tra change the antibiotics as you wish. Now, the other question to ask with this patient who's coming in with fever, nausea, vomiting, and pain is, do they have sepsis? Sepsis is pretty serious because that's when the response to infection is overtaking our body's ability to control it and fight it. So we ought to act on sepsis six. Quick basic medicine, what is the sepsis six? Okay, that is three in. Do we know about the three in, three out model? Okay, I think we're slowly piecing it together. So we measure or we take bloods, which is blood cultures and bloods, um, urine and lactate, and we give fluids, antibiotics and oxygen. So this is bread and butter of foundation medicine. Always act on sepsis six if you're worried about a patient. Typically, they'll start to present, you know, tachycardic, fever, pyrexial, hypotensive, and there's a strict criteria as well, which will be like in bold, you know, pasted on the walls of your um, hospital. Again, antibiotics for pyelonephritis will depend on your trust, but it can be ciprofloxacin, trimethoprim, coamoxiclav or cephalexin. Generally, uh, if they're septic anyway, you would start with a broad spectrum antibiotic, you know, something that treats general sepsis, and then you would tailor it accordingly. But pyelonephritis is pretty simple. Okay, now the story continues. So we've looked at uncomplicated UTI, we've looked at pyelonephritis, and now we have this patient who comes in and she's 48. Now she's come back with a fifth UTI in a duration of a few years. And she still goes, you know what? I can still see blood. What are you thinking? Or what would you do for this patient? Okay, we have a few answers there. Some are saying obstruction, urological investigations, that's quite broad. Consider a two week. Okay, interesting. Now, If any patient who's above 45 
and either have hematoria without a UTI or if they have recurrent UTI with hematoria, like in this patient, cancer unless proven otherwise. So you are very, very highly suspicious for urological or gynae cancers. So you send them on the two week pathway. And I'm not gonna go through, but this link, which I think will be sent in the slides later anyway, is pretty brilliant actually, nice CKS, which is my go-to for any form of um, diagnosis that I'm trying to work through. And it very much goes through um, how to recognize different types of cancers, urological and gynecological, and what are the different steps to take. But yes, you have to be thinking of malignancy. So you consider cancer, send them on a two-week wait. They will typically have, yes, they'll have an ultrasound KUB, they'll have a full set of bloods, they'll have a full kind of screen to figure out, you know, is there some form of malignancy going on there? Now, same symptoms, different gender. So you have a man, not a woman now, with lower urinary tract symptoms. So when I say LUTs, can anyone think of um, what some of the uh, LUTs symptoms are? Feel free to drop them in the chat. Okay, we've got uh, we've got some symptoms. Very good, very good. And you can actually classify LUTs symptoms into three categories: storage symptoms, voiding symptoms, or post void symptoms. So storage symptoms are anything where you know something's up with their bladder. So this is where they have increased frequency, increased urgency, incontinence and nocturia, so having to pee at night. Voiding symptoms is anything where it's a little bit more sphincteral uh, or anything that is obstructing their urethra. So there you have kind of slow stream, hesitancy, they're straining, something's quite blocked there, and they have this terminal dribble. And then you have post-void symptoms where you, know, you, you want to, you've, you've peed, but it feels incomplete, or you might have a post-void dribble. So this patient uh, says, yes, I dribble after I wee and it feels incomplete. So he's look, sounding a bit more post void. It's important to classify LUT symptoms into the categories as much as you can, because the management will follow suit accordingly. So determine where is the issue? Is it with storage? Is it with voiding? Or is it with post voiding? And you will actually be guided by your history and examination here. Now, the first thing, and a lot of you guys pointed to the prostate. So the first thing you always ask yourself is, these are the few questions to ask yourself. How's the prostate doing? How's the bladder doing? Um, are there any external genital abnormalities that I can see? And how is their general neurological function? I.e., do they have any uh, kind of uh, diabetic pathology? Do they actually have, you know, very rare, and you'll probably pick this up early on, but do they have some form of cordoquina syndrome that's contributing to their incontinence? Um, how's their neurological function? So these are kind of like the four areas to think of when you have a patient presenting with LUTs. And again, you always got to ask yourself, could it be an infection? Could it be cancer? Could it be neurological? We've looked at infection. We've broadly looked at cancer. And with neurological, you rely back on your uh, history examination. You do all of your power turn uh, examinations across your lumbar, um, lower limbs, because that's where the same innovation happens. And if you're suspicious, you send them for a CT spine uh, or MRI spine or a CT head. Typically, it'll be a spine if you're worried about neurological. If they have a, a bit more like diabetes or something metabolic, then it will come up in their past medical history. It will rarely be a first presentation. Then you investigate, right? Again, common things. You do a urine dip. You would send off for some renal function bloods. So you'll go for um, renal function test. You would have examined the prostate by now as part of the examination. So you'd have done your PR exam. And if you find that your prostate is enlarged or irregular, you would go for a PSA test. 
But again, you always typically would like to warn the patient for its specificity and sensitivity. In what cases might you have an abnormally raised PSA um, that actually is not uh, true to a prostate pathology? So i.e. a false positive PSA or a falsely high PSA. Okay, very good. I'm seeing some of the answers come through. There's a whole list. Um, if they are older patients, if they had a recent uh, PR exam, um, if they've been exercising a lot, any infection, any physical causes, or as always, what we are suspecting, prostate enlargement. They can also have a false positive PSA with a normal prostate as well. Um, that's with, as with any test that can happen. So how would you manage a patient who presents with LUTs? Now, as I mentioned earlier, where in their renal tract lies the pathology will give you a clue as to how to manage this patient. So you can again, um, um, you can again um, classify this. So if this is something uh, to do with the voiding, i.e. something a bit more sphincteral, the sphincter is not working or the prostate is enlarged, so it's not um, allowing for the passage of urine properly, these are the things that you can throw in at them. Conservative management, we always start with conservative. Pelvic floor muscle training. Or ask them to fluid restrict. Again, not take too much fluid. Avoid caffeine. These are some of the simple things that you can advise. In terms of things that can tighten the sphincter up, you would prescribe for an alpha blocker. If they have an enlarged prostate and you're able to confirm that, then you throw in a 5-alpha reductase inhibitor like a finasteride. If you're worried about an overactive bladder, again, conservatively, you go for a bladder training. So, you know, you can refer them to the incontinence, incontinence clinic or the continence clinic. They can have a bladder diary and they um, go through the bladder training program. Medically, you prescribe an anticholinergic, so an oxybutynin or toldegredrin. If they don't tolerate either of these, you go for a mirabegron. More invasive, so again, this is a bit more, you know, second line or third line, you then opt for a Botox, uh, botulinum toxin injection or a sacral nerve stimulation. If they are retaining um, urine, i.e., you know, it's all sitting in their bladder, you catheterize. The threshold is around 350 mils. You don't wait to figure out what is causing it, you catheterize straight away. I have been called so many times in my nights with patients retaining urine of about a litre in their bladder. And that's a lot of volume to sit in a bladder. So that has its own complications and it's not a situation you want to be in. So just catheterize and then deal with it later. You can deal with the cause later and then you can trial them without a catheter later. But always, always catheterize if they are retaining. Now, here's a quick question for you guys, um, only because I have seen this uh, just twice actually in the last week that I had patients. You have patient with um, with voiding symptoms and uh, he's got BPH. So you prescribe him a finasteride and you also throw in a tamsulosin, uh, which is an alpha blocker. Now, this patient uh, suddenly has a few days into admission, uh, standing blood pressure of 60, 60 over 37. What do you think is going on? Okay, so what's the first thing that you do if uh, very good? So you would stop the medications, repeat the blood pressure, and then if they're still um, having postural hypotension, you would start them on a midridin uh, or something that can perk it up. Uh, I've had two patients just in the last week, and it took uh, the previous doctors three days to figure out that actually he wasn't an alpha blocker, so he should be stopped on it. So just uh, remember that while these drugs are being treated for a specific condition, they do work system, um, system, systematically. So we'll just give everyone 30 more seconds before we kick off. And just as a quick recap, uh, we've come so far, we've covered basic renal physiology. We've looked at a little bit about electrolyte imbalances and focusing in on sodium. 
we've done hematuria, we've uh, looked at the whole host of hematuria and how that could lead to different things. And now we are at acute kidney injury. And I hope so far we can appreciate that actually um, practicing renal medicine is not hard. It's uh, very much logical. And there's only a few things that you can do really uh, for renal medicine before you resort to something like transplantation at the worst case or dialysis. So it's not actually as hard as uh, one might think. Okay, so we'll carry on and we'll carry on to acute kidney injury. Now, again, this is probably something that we will see a lot in hospital in patients. Um, and I can say quite uh, with confidence in any specialty that you're at, you will see patients with acute kidney injury. I had a patient who was uh, post uncomplicated, normal routine appendicectomy. She was meant to be discharged actually. And I, I was just like, you know what, let me just do a set of bloods on you. Um, you're, you're not really going to the bathroom as much. Let me just do a set of bloods before I discharge you. I'd done all of her paperwork. She was ready to go home. And I see the blood results and I go, you are not going home. Uh, her EGFR, which we'll come to, was 1414. Her creatinine was in the 200s. She was talking and walking. She was fine. But I was like, you're not going home. Turns out she had an acute kidney injury. No one knew what caused it. Um, and we're trying to figure out the cause. And within a couple of days, she got better. But yeah, that's uh, it's something that will jump out of nowhere. So it's something important for us to just get a grasp on if we can. So I think I gave a hint to that acute kidney injury. When I say acute, how acute are we talking? Does anyone have a ballpark on the time? How fast or how quick can AKIs manifest? Yeah, it can be as short as within 24 hours and prolonged to within seven days. So the duration of acute kidney injury is, it can be quite acute. So Acute kidney injury can come through a whole host of symptoms. Again, it's quite uh, generalized because the patients will present uh, with different things. And, you know, it depends on where the pathology is. But typically, if someone comes in with a low urine output, they're not producing as much urine and their creatinine is creeping up, you're suspicious of an acute kidney injury. You have three stages of acute kidney injury based on the creatinine jump. So typically you can classify AKI into stage one, stage two, stage three. And this, this depends on how high the creatinine is compared to its baseline. But when we look at acute kidney injury, practically we classify it by anatomy. Is it pre-renal? Is it renal or is it post-renal? And this is why I took us through the whistle stop tour of the renal tract at the start because with something like AKI, it's important to consider the entire renal tract anatomy and physiology. So if you're thinking it's pre-renal, now this is a patient who is getting an acute kidney injury because they are hypoperfused, i.e. they're not getting enough blood into their kidneys. So typically these patients are likely to be hypotensive, generally dehydrated, you know, not doing very well systematically. So you would check their volume status and you would correct. So you would you know, give fluids and see why they are being hypoperfused. Is it actually something going on with their heart that's triggering their kidneys? You'd start to think of uh, them a bit more system systemically. Anything that's renal most commonly is usually drug caused. So you would take their drug chart and go through all the different things that could be causing an, an injury to the kidney. And we're going to look at some nephrotoxic drugs in the next slide. Or actually, are they breaking down muscle? Are they causing, are they having rhabdomyolysis that is causing them to clog up the kidney and thus they're going into renal AKI? Does anyone know of the most common drug that leads to rhabdomyolysis? Something to be cautious about. Very good. Statins. Absolutely. So typically in an inpatient setting, if a patient has an AKI, we stop the statins uh, at least for 48 hours and then we review. Then we think about post renal. Are they obstructed? So is their prostate so enlarged that it's sending uh, a back passage 
through to their kidneys and damaging their kidneys? Or is there a stone somewhere? Now, whilst the symptoms of AKI and the classification of it can seem complicated, management of AKI is dead easy. All you got to do is fluid resuscitate and monitor. You literally pump them with 0.9% saline and you monitor. Um, every day you take their renal function test, you check how their EGFR is going, how their creatinine is going, and you alert the renal team in the hospital sooner rather than later. We got told off by the surgical, as, as the surgical team for waiting for three days before we alerted a patient of AKI to the renal teams. So do let the renal team in the hospital know. And again, with something like AKI, it's very much symptomatic um, management quickly, caution, putting caution to their overall clinical status and their drug status, and making sure that they don't go into AKI again or going into the chronic side. So generally, on discharge paperwork, this is just uh, uh, you know extra learning for you guys. In a discharge paperwork, at least in my trust, they always ask, did your patient have an AKI during admission? And we got to put tick yes or no. And typically, we'll then stop the drugs, tweak the drugs, and you know we answer whether the AKI was resolved on admission. Any patient who has an AKI on admission, automatically within a week, they will have to repeat their bloods at the GP. And there's a whole host of regimen. So they'll have um, weekly blood tests for a month, and then they'll have mon three monthly blood tests, and then six monthly blood tests. So it's actually quite monitored, well monitored in the community setting, even post discharge, because you don't want to want them to go down the chronic kidney disease path. That's why you monitor them quite closely. Now we talked about nephrotoxic drugs, right? And there are nephrotoxic drugs that can, again, um, cause AKI in all three stages, in the pre-renal, renal, and post-renal stages. So in the pre-renal, typically, we worry about NSAIDs, uh, any form of ibuprofen, diclofenac, et cetera, stop it, and ACE inhibitors. Now, ACE inhibitors is a tricky one. So generally, you would stop ACE inhibitors in an AKI setting, but it actually helps in a chronic kidney disease setting. And we'll see why when we come to the chronic kidney disease slides. We, call, we are cautious about ACE inhibitors because especially with patients who have bilateral renal artery stenosis, i.e. their renal arteries are so closed off, if you give them an ACE inhibitor, you're going to constrict it even more. So you're going to lead to hypoperfusion. So in an acute setting, we stop it anyway, and we restart it at discharge. With renal, you can have um, drugs that affect either um, the tubules, it affects the interstitium, which is the space between the nephron and the, um, which is the space between the nephrons, or the actual glomerulus itself. So that's what glomerulonephritis is. So you have all these whole host of drugs that can affect. Now, I'm not going to go through the mechanism and stuff because, frankly speaking, you don't need to know about it. But if you're aware that some of these drugs can cause uh, some of your AKI, you can then automatically rule it off. So the trend-wise, if you can see the trends, typically um, antibiotics, uh, any form of uh, metal-based drugs like penicillamine, uh, gold, um, anything that's a bit of a dirty drug, um, anything that's... Uh, you know, something that's not common, diuretics. So these are drugs that you ought to be cautious about. So in a, in a clinical practice, I would just literally go through all the different drugs that a patient's on, go to the BNF and look at the renal impairment section or the renal, the caution for renal um, segment and read through and cancel um, because it's more than likely they don't need it in the acute setting. And then you have post-renal where again, drugs such as methotrexate, acetazolamide, hydrosulfonamides can you know, cause crystal deposits that very much obstruct your urinary tract and as a result, cause AKI. Now, this is something you can commit to your memory if you wish. So I'm just gonna leave this, this slide you'll get again. Um, but again, uh, anticholinergics and alcohol can also cause urinary tract obstruction um, and can cause retention of urine in the bladder. And as a result, you can get um, AKI. So it's pretty straightforward. Now, CKD, chronic kidney disease. CKD is one of those things where it is, you can never 
cure a CKD, if that makes sense. You can very much, the, the aim of a CKD is to stop the progression and to keep a patient stable. There is no going back with a CKD. That's the most important thing about a chronic kidney disease. You can't cure a patient out of a chronic kidney disease. You can either keep them at that stable point or you prevent them from going down any further. So patients with chronic kidney disease comes in very, very, um, it's very insidious, right? They'll just say, you know what? I'm not feeling very great, just a bit tired, have a bit of bone pain, I have to get up at night to pee. And sometimes I go small amounts. Now they said something quite um, interesting there where they say burn pain. Why do we think patients with CKD can have burn pain? Okay, let's stay, let's simplify things a little bit. Absolutely, vitamin D. Vitamin D metabolism happens in the kidneys. So if the kidneys are shut or you know, they're not functioning properly, that's going to affect our burn health, right? Let's keep things simple. That's the beauty of medicine. So typical symptoms of these patients can be general, you know, very much just lethargy, cramping, can't sleep well, vomiting, weight loss, you know, very, very generalized. They can have urinary symptoms. So they can have either polyuria where they have increased frequency of urine or actually uh, oliguria or anuria uh, where they're not producing enough urine at all. And some of the signs that you can see is, you know, they're very pale, they can be quite cachectic, dehydrated, hypertensive. They may have actually masses in their flanks. Um, they can palpate their bladder and they're quite swollen up and their urine can be quite frothy because there's protein deposition um, in the urine. So it's all quite vague. So how do we go about a CKD? First, we would always do a set of bloods anyway. So the most important thing is to measure the EGFR, so the glomerular filtration rate, and the creatinine. You would then measure what we call as either a protein creatinine ratio, a PCR, or an albumin creatinine ratio. And they're pretty much the same thing. Like some trusts opt for ACR more than PCR, but it's pretty much the same thing. If you have a high protein creatinine ratio in the urine, remember, we're not meant to lose any protein in the urine. So if we are having a high ratio, that means we are losing protein somewhere. You would then always do a dipstick, right? You're still querying for infection. And you would look at cardiac risk factors. They're presenting with a whole host of systemic symptoms. So is there something going wrong in the heart? Are they actually in congestive cardiac failure? If you think that actually uh, you can feel some masses in the flank um, or, you know, they seem to be quite obstructed in nature, you could do a renal tract ultrasound to see if there's any history or indication of polycystic kidney disease or previous stones. But then to diagnose chronic kidney disease, what separates a CKD from, say, an AKI or anything else is when you have a persistent reduction in renal function along with protein urea for at least three months. So for anything to be chronic, it has to last for at least three months. So your EGFR is not doing so well and or you're having protein deposition in the urine. And this is going on for at least three months. That would mark a CKD. So if a patient doesn't quite fit the criteria, right, and they still have the risk factors, what would you do? Any, any guesses here? simple. You would monitor. So you would check the blood and the urine levels annually. And actually, if you're more worried, you would increase the frequency, but you monitor. Because like I said, once you get into a, a CKD stage, there is no going back. So you have different stages of CKD as well. And it goes up until five, stage five. So stage one is where actually their kidney functions normal, but they seem to have increased um, albumin creatinine ratio. But you need to have some form of a marker of kidney damage for you to actually say they're in CKD stage one. So that could mean uh, a few things marked below. So do they have albumin in their urine? Uh, are their electrolytes a bit whack? Or do they have any urine sediments, you know, any uh, complement deposits or et cetera that is picked up in the urine? So you, you would send a, a urine sample anyway into the lab. Then you go for stage two. Um, and, and as you can see, it's more dependent on the EGFR 
than the creatinine. Where in AKR, you're more concerned about the creatinine. In CKD, you're more concerned about the EGFR. And the fall in EGFR goes down to their, um, as you go down the stages of CKD, the EGFR goes down further and further and further. So you've figured out, okay, you know what? This patient is in CKD. Now what? First figure out the course. Why are they going into CKD? How fast are they going into CKD? Um, and how fast are they progressing? And how can I treat the course? And remember, always watch for the FBC. Um, Remember, um, if we're not producing enough erythropoietin, like we looked at in the function of kidneys, uh, chronic kidney disease can predispose us to have normocytic anemia. Um, so always watch for the hemoglobin and the full blood count levels. Watch for your different uh, vitamin D and the vitamin D uh, agents, parathyroid hormone, calcium and phosphate. And don't forget about cancer. So if they are presenting with a persistent UTI or hematuria, do not forget about cancer. So these are some of the few things to remember with a patient whom you're worried about could be a CKD. Whatever that you see symptomatically with a CKD, you correct. So with something like a CKD, you can't reverse the CKD, right? So all you can do is figure out why are they going into CKD? Is it something to do with their another condition? Is it something to do with their medications? Is it something a bit more systemic? You then treat the cause as per those, you then treat the cause and then make sure that the kidneys are stable. So you would correct the anemia. If there's any metabolic disturbances, you would correct the metabolic disturbances and you try not to get them to the end stage renal disease. So if they are at an end stage renal disease, they may need renal replacement therapy, dialysis or transplant. The number of patients that I can uh, that I have currently in uh, my COVID ward is almost every one of them in the Jerry section have CKD. So I have to remember actually the CKD is there, but can I prevent the CKD turning into an AKI? At least three of my patients have presented with acute kidney injury on a background of CKD. So I can only really support the CKD symptomatically, but how is their anemia? How is their uh, electrolytes? How is their calcium phosphate, vitamin D levels? Those are the things that I ought to watch for. If they have hypertension, lisinopril or any form of ACE inhibitors is your best shot. But again, here's a caution. Do not give two drugs that affect the renin, angiotensin, aldosterone system. Why do we not give a double drug in a patient who is hypertensive with a CKD? What do we what do we not what do we not want to send them into? Very good. We do not want to send them into a pre-renal AKI. With all patients with a CKD, again, give them a statin. Because if their kidneys are not working properly, chances are that it's going to, you know, clog up their heart. Chances are that it's going to have an effect on their heart and other systems. So you give a statin for all patients with CKD to, you know, you look at that patient as a whole. And again, what's the one caution with statins that we talked about earlier? Just to check that you guys are listening, rhabdomyolysis. Very good. Because that, again, throws them into AKI. So you see how there's a lovely cycle here. You want to prevent, you want to maintain their CKD, but you don't want them going into AKI. And some of the very things that you're doing to treat a CKD, if you're not careful, can throw them into an AKI. So that's AKI and CKD. In terms of management, genuinely, both are very simple in terms of managing. So it's not the management that's hard. It's just very much getting to the understanding of AKI and CKD that throws people off. But I hope we're able to gain a slightly better understanding of AKI and CKD now. So a couple of, um, I guess, final topics. And um, I won't spend too much time because these topics I find are quite... They're quite bitty, but you don't really see them as much in clinical practice. So whilst they're great for exam purposes, they're also pretty straightforward. So 
The first one is protein in the urine. One of the big things that we get to learn about protein in the urine is what we call as nephrotic syndrome. And it is that golden triad. You have protein urea, so protein in the urine. You have hypoalbuminemia. So it's not albuminuria, it's albuminemia. So low albumin in the blood. And you have edema. Makes sense, right? You're putting, you're, you're gushing out all your protein. Uh, you are having reduced protein in your blood. And because you have reduced protein in your blood, you're automatically attracting water into the vessel because of the osmotic gradient. So you, you become blown up. So it's pretty straightforward. Now with anything where you're worried about a nephrotic syndrome, always ask yourself, are they kids or are they adults? In kids, the 80% chance of any kid presenting with a nephrotic syndrome-like picture is very much minimal change disease. So some form of damage to the glomerulus. Typically, you treat them with steroids. Any form of kind of um, glomerular, glomerular, glomerular nephritis that you're suspecting, you treat them with steroids. Um, the treatment is the same, regardless of all your different classifications. You treat them on steroids and see how responsive they are. With adults, you ask yourself, is it primary or is it secondary? So is it primarily uh, a problem in the kidneys or is it due to something else? The most common cause of um, nephrotic syndrome in adults, the primary is focal segmental glomerulosclerosis. Now, these are all some big words, right? What do they actually mean? I'll be honest with you guys, I didn't quite understand this in medical school. So I thought, let me take this opportunity to debunk some of the terminology so that we're not confusing our heads with all the different terms. Glomerular nephritis is an umbrella term. It's an umbrella term for anything that where you have an inflammation of the glomerulus and the nephron around it. Glomerular nephritis. Interstitial nephritis is where you have inflammation between the tubules. So we saw that nephron with the tubular system. Any kind of inflammation that happens around it is interstitial nephritis. Glomerular sclerosis. Now, this is not a diagnosis. This is just a pathological finding. And this is where the, 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 the tissue of the glomerulus is very much scarred. So it's not quite um, as robust. And it's something that you see in a histology rather than something you would diagnose and say they've got glomerular sclerosis. You only have one specific disease that causes this primarily, which is focal segmental glomerular sclerosis. But you have different types of glomerular nephritis that can lead to glomerular sclerosis because it's a change in your tissue. It's a change in your tissue structure. I hope this makes sense so far. It's a lot to take in. So this is like the whole list of all the different types of glomerular nephritis, um, inflammation of the glomerulus, right? The most common one that we saw in kids is minimal change disease. The pathology of it is actually poorly understood. And for those of us who are past med junkies, the podocyte food, pro food processes is like one of the clues that you, know, you, you get to answer in an SBA. But typically you treat these kids with steroid. You then have your focal segmental glomerular sclerosis and your membranous glomerular nephritis. Again, these are all classified according to the different deposits that you can have, but the treatment of it is the same. Just whack them with steroids. You then have the two types of infective um, nephropathies or glomerular nephritis. So one is the IgA nephropathy and the other is the post-streptococcal glomerular nephritis. There is one distinction between the two, and one occurs uh, a few days after a viral illness. The other one occurs a few weeks after a viral illness. Is anyone able to recall which one is which? Very good. IgA nephropathy is when it's a few days after, and post-strep glomerular nephritis is a few weeks after. Again, they'll all present with um, protein urea, sometimes a bit of blood. Um, and so 
classifying it very much just gives us an assurance okay this is what's happening and i'm not in all honesty i'm not going to go through the detail of it because it's very uh it's something that you just commit to memory and it's not something that you see often in clinical practice the most common cause of nephrotic syndrome, like we saw earlier, is the focal segmental glomerulosclerosis. And the most common primary cause of glomerulonephritis is IgA nephropathy. So someone who's had a viral illness and a few days later starts to have protein in the urine. Yeah, think of this. You have two peaks with a membranous glomerulonephritis, one in a young age, so in the 20s, and the other in the 60s. And like we said, post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis can be three weeks following a viral illness. And that's presenting more with hematoria-like. So I know there's a lot of distinction. There's a lot of questions between um, nephritic syndrome and nephrotic syndrome. So there's a diagram that is uh, in the next slide. But genuinely, whilst there's so many terminologies here, it does get easier. By management principle, fluid restrict, get any excess fluid out because they are fully edematous, give steroids and control the blood pressure. If you can remember this one line, that one line will help you through any of the nephrotic and nephrotic syndromes. Fluid restrict, get the excess fluid out, give them steroids and control the blood pressure. It is as simple. And that's the same rule for all of these. Okay, now you can ask, Hold on, we started with nephrotic syndrome and then we took a whole whirlwind through glomerulonephritis. So where does nephritic syndrome fit into all of this? So nephrotic syndrome is very much, uh, you know, any damage that happens in that barrier between the glomerulus and the basement membrane. So that's why you get protein leaking through into the nephron. And that's why you get protein urea you get hypoalbuminemia, and you get edema. Nephritic syndrome, on the other hand, is more inflammation-based. You have inflammation that disrupts the basement membrane. So you have you know, a whole host of inflammatory processes that happen that often trigger blood going into the urine. And that's why you have hematoria. And commonly in the clinical practice, you can say this as Coca-Cola urine. This is something that past med or past people questions love, good pastures and wagoners. And they are, there are, um, we're not allowed to use eponyms anymore. So you have uh, the proper terms uh, that you address for these two. I'll let you guys Google that. But uh, wagoners and good pastures is a, a full kind of um, inflammatory picture that affects um, the kidneys along with other things. So with good pastures, it's basically an autoimmune, where wagoners is an inflammatory condition. So um, with good pastures, you have anti-GBM antibodies, which attacks the basement membrane of the kidneys, as well as the lungs. That's why you, this patient will present with AKI, so low urine output, high creatinine, and will, with hemoptysis, they'll cough up blood. So you can think, okay, you know what, this sounds more like good pasture syndrome. Wagoners, on the other hand, typical saddle-shaped nose, They'll have a wheeze, they'll have a sinusitis, apart from uh, hematuria and proteinuria. So this is just something for you guys to remember before an exam. Wagoners are good pastures because in an SBA, you'll be able to distinguish uh, between the two with these symptoms. So we have our last topic at hand today, and that is kidney stones. Now, kidney stones is fairly straightforward, um, but I thought just to lighten the mood a little bit, this is a two minute clip that we're going to watch uh, from friends. Uh, if you're all friends fans, we'll appreciate this, but not just for entertainment, right? Watch the clip and actually tell me what symptoms, investigations and managements are you able to pick up about kidney stones from this clip? It's actually quite cleverly done. So we'll take like a two minute uh, whiz through this short clip. Um. Okay. Hey, you guys, look what I found in the kitchen. Shop. Oh. oh, get up, get up, get up. Oh. Mr. Tribbiani, I'm afraid you've got kidney stones. Uh, well, what else could it be? It's kidney stones. 
for getting me stones. <laughs> if it was something else, that would be getting me stones. <laughs> you know better, sweetie? Maybe a little. Wish you hadn't seen me throw up. <laughs> me too. I just heard. What's up? Kidney stones. <laughs> now, ordinarily, Mr. Tribbiani, we tried to break the stones up with shock waves, but they're too close to the bladder now. Which means we can either wait for you to pass them, or else go up the urethra. Oh. <laughs> no, 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 no. Nothing is going up, okay? Up. Up is not an option. What's a urethra? <laughs> Are you crazy? Oh, get these things out of me. Breathe. Breathe through the pain. I want the drugs, Ross. I want the drugs. I do, too. I do, too. Are you ready? It's time to try peeing. It's almost time to try me. Yeah, oh my god. You did it, man. Would you like to see them? Okay, I hope that was a little bit of entertainment for us. But in all that laughter, can we pick out um so they mentioned a few things, right? So what are the acute symptoms of kidney stones that we can think of? Okay. Intense colicky flank pain, dysuria. Anything else? Nausea and vomiting, sweating, absolutely. And sometimes if it's a little bit more, you know, severe or if they've thrown themselves into some form of pyelonephritis, you can also get a fever. Um, absolutely. So what about um, what about the investigations for an AK, uh, for a kidney stone? How would you typically investigate renal calculi? And they mentioned in that clip something about um, shock waves, sending uh, shock waves to, to break up the stones. Do we know what is uh, the name of, of that uh, management? OK, brilliant. So some of you have got it. So let's just run through a whistle stop tour of kidney stones. So small. Oops. So sudden onset colicky loin to groin pain. Essentially, our ureters are trying to palpate. Um, they're trying to, it's the peristaltic movement, and that's why you get that colicky pain. It's always important, right? We always suddenly think, oh, that could be kidney stones. But it's always important to rule out um, in a younger patient appendicitis and in an older patient diverticulitis um, in, in a presentation of renal calculi. You also want to rule out any infection or any obstruction due to the stone. So again, with an obstruction, you do a quick bladder scan to check if they are retaining any urine. For an infection, you rule out, um, you do a simple urine dip, see if they are febrile, start them on antibiotics, take a culture. So those basic principles still apply. And then um, investigation of choice. So I'm going by the NICE CKS guideline. Um, which is the clinical knowledge summaries by the NICE. And the investigation of choice as put out by NICE CKS is actually a non-contrast CT first. But if they're pregnant, you would then go for a ultrasound. This may change with trusts, but this is what the NICE CKS recommends. In terms of managing the pain, like whilst you're investigating, this person is screaming in pain, right? You would want to give them an NSAID, uh, plus or minus paracetamol. And actually, um, in a lot of uh, the British Association of Urological Surgeons, the BAUS, um, they will they will um, indicate um, diclofenac as the most optimum choice of an NSAID. Oops, this keeps playing. Um, and actually. Um, not that it matters in clinical practice so much, but a lot of past papers will ask for, what is a stone made of? 80% of all stones are calcium oxalate. 
And this diagram very much summarizes all the different types of stones and where it is most common. Something that is radio opaque is something that will be seen in an X-ray. Something that's radiolucent is something that will not be seen in an X-ray. So calcium oxalate is the most common. And some of our complicated stones, like you can see the staghorn calculi, also known as struvite, um, that's something uh, that is less common, but is what we call an uncom uh, a complicated renal calculi. Typically, if patients are dehydrated, you would give them fluids. If they're infected, you would give them antibiotics. So the general clinical principles still apply. But then you have figured out, okay, you know what? They have renal calculi. How do you manage them? So any stone which is less than five millimeters, typically you can treat them conservatively. You can give an alpha blocker to help pass that stone. So you may give opt for an alpha blocker there. Anything that's over five millimeter, your, your first line that you commonly go for is an extracorporeal wave lithotripsy. Now, this is the diagram that is actually uh, shown in the, in, the, in the top right hand corner where you're blasting the stone through the skin. So it's not invasive but you would not use this for any patient who's anticoagulated or pregnant. If it's blocked and they, have in, in, and they are infected, generally you would go for a um, nephrostomy. So this is where you are um, bypassing the um, stone, the, you're bypassing the passage of the stone and you're draining out um, what's happening through a tube and uh, you would go percutaneously. You can also go for a rigid urethroscopy, and that's what in Friends they were talking about, passing something up the urethra. Now, that is uh, not pleasant, but that's why a nephrostomy, rigid urethroscopy, and a percutaneous nef uh, nephrolithotomy, they're all done under general anesthesia. So you can go up the urethra, and you can blast the stone and relieve it that way. Or as a last resort, you can go for percutaneous nephrolithotomy where you can go in through a sheet, um, and this is where it's probably stuck in your upper renal tract, um, as in the diagram in the bottom left, where it's stuck, stuck in one of your calices. So you would then have to go in and take it out. So kidney stones are pretty straightforward. And actually a lot of past people questions from my experience like to ask about which stones are radio opaque and which stones are radio lucent. And they'll almost throw in a, this patient is pregnant. What would be your first line management option? Um, and key principles don't arrive at a kidney stone until you've ruled out appendicitis and diverticulitis. It can still manifest uh, as an appendicitis or diverticulitis as well. Okay, now someone's asked, does the NSAID does not worsen the condition to cause AKI? Now, in a kidney stone type situation, you don't actually have a lot of patients going into AKI. The reason that you would, um, your kidney function is still fine. Uh, you're, you're not going into acute kidney injury with, an AK, uh, with a kidney stone. You're just obstructed and you're in pain. But of course, take it with caution. If you feel like actually they are going to, they're severely obstructed, they're infected, and they are at risk of going into AKI because they already have a chronic kidney disease, then yes, absolutely take your NSAIDs with caution. But in a normal patient like you and I, if we have a kidney stone, we can easily have a diclofenac and we'll be fine. Sometimes they often opt for, I've seen this a lot in general surgery, but I know they do this in urology as well, for quick pain relief. Rather than giving oral diclofenac, they go for PR, rectal diclofenac. So it's more short-term burst of NSAID um, that goes up, uh, that gets absorbed in the heavy vasculature. Um, but I'm not sure to what extent is in the proper guidelines. So I know that... Um, Oral NSAIDs are approved for uncomplicated kidney stones where you're not suspecting other comorbidities. But if you are suspecting comorbidities, you know, look at the patient as a whole and then take a judgment accordingly. At your stage, they shouldn't be that mean and ask you to think about those things. So as a general principle, it's okay to give NSAIDs in an uncomplicated renal calculi. So with, I guess, I guess, 
in the last one hour and 40 minutes, we have literally taken a massive whistle stop tour through renal physiology and common renal conditions. I am aware that there may be ha there may have been conditions that I've not touched upon today because I've tried to keep most of the high yield things and cover the common things that are common. Um, of course, you know, I've kept things at a basic level because the more we complicate things, uh, the more I feel like it's actually not necessary for clinical practice. Keep things simple, um, understand why things happen and you'll be able to work through it. And as mentioned earlier, with renal medicine, the management of renal medicine is pretty straightforward. There's only a few tests that you can do, whether it's a urine dip, a urine culture, renal function tests, uh, a non-contrast CT, maybe an ultrasound. These are the common things that you can do for a range of renal conditions. Um, there's only a few things of management wise you can do for renal conditions as well. If it's something uh, inflammatory, uh, i.e. nephrotic syndrome, like give them steroids. If it's uh, something like AKI, CKD, they're dehydrated, hyponatremic, give them uh, supportive uh, IV fluids and monitor, resuscitate. If it's infection, you give them antibiotics. If you're suspecting a malignancy, go to the two-week pathway and then take out, go down the investigations for the two-week pathway of cancer. So it's pretty straightforward in that sense. There's not many things you can do. And most of the things with renal medicine that we can appreciate is you'll get a lot of things coming through your doors, regardless of the specialty that you're at that affects the kidneys, because they are ultimately our filtration mechanism, right? If our filtration system is shot, it affects the rest of our body because we're not able to get things out. So if we adopt by those principles, we can easily navigate through the different renal pathologies that come our way. So my top tips are that I recommend for all of you, and I can appreciate that even I'm learning again, uh, you get to forget a lot of these intricacies and details when you start practicing day-to-day uh, -day medicine. So I've learned a few things from you guys today as well. But just work through things methodically, right? The exam questions are not there to trip you up. And people like to, you know, read the most, you know, uncommon eponymous conditions that someone discovered. But really, that's not what the exam questions are there for. They're there to test, are you a safe doctor? And can you navigate through the basic clinical conditions? And actually understand the basics. If you can work through basic renal physiology and can go through everything that we've covered today and really logically put yourself through that journey, renal's not hard. And try to understand the why. Um, for some things, yes, you may have to memorize it, commit to memories, like some of the drugs and stuff. But you have, if you have the time, just take the time to understand why it happens and how it affects, because you can logically work through a lot of things as well. And practice. Uh, this is where some of the past people questions like uh, past test and BMJ can come in handier. I recommend these if you've done past med already, because past med sometimes likes to ask for the weird and wonderful things. But past test and BMJ questions actually go through things a bit more logically. So if you have the time and the money, uh, you can invest in some of these online question portals. And don't fret if you don't understand this today. That's okay. Um, renal is not a common thing that gets asked, you know, across, uh, say, in an exam paper. You, most of the questions will not be renal. But a lot of the learning also comes with the job. I've learned a lot of things uh, I've picked up in my first couple of jobs. So... Most of the learning comes there. So don't fret if you don't understand it at this stage. And the message that I wish to leave all of you with is don't study to pass the test at the end of the day. Um, study to prepare for the day where you're the only thing between a patient and grave. And especially during these COVID times, uh, you guys will be in situations uh, when you become a doctor where you're actually asked to manage patients independently. You're at the full trust of the consultant. So really, really think about what you're doing for your patient. And remember to look at the patient as a whole. Um, remember to look at their drug charts. Remember to look at their past medical history. And remember to look at them. Um, they give us a lot more clues than what we can ask for. So I hope this was useful. And do drop in your feedback and thoughts. And yeah, good luck to all of you who are in different stages of your medical journey.